And Dr. Minkoff's title of his talk today is, Could Amino Acid Deficiencies Be the Reason You Are Sick and Tired? Let's give a big welcome to Dr. Minkoff. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Are you awake? Okay. Uh, good. Um, so I titled this Tools for Healers. How many people here are healers? Come on, that's, you're working with people, you're a healer. Okay. We all went to school in some form and learned some technical trade. Whether you're a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a doctor, a nutritionist, doesn't matter. You learned how to do something about something and all that's good. Uh, what most people haven't learned is that one of the most healing aspects of medicine has to do with heart, not technology. It's not brain, it's heart. Now, our history as medical doctors is pretty checkered. And um, if you look through the history of medicine, there's probably at least as much harm as there has been good from what's been done to people. So this is George Washington get bled, getting bled to death by his doctor. This is an ad in the Journal of the American Medical Association on why camels are the best cigarettes to smoke if you're a doctor, doctor recommended. When I was in my first year of medical school, my dad had a near fatal heart attack and I remember going to the ICU and seeing him and then being taken downstairs uh, and being talked to by the doctor who said the reason he got the heart attack was because he ate butter and rendered chicken fat and that clogged up his arteries and he could never eat that again. He said what we recommend is margarine, uh, medical advice. If your doctor looks like this, you got to question why he's not practicing his own trade. Of course, dentists do as much damage to people as doctors, so I didn't want to leave them out. <laughs> Probably the biggest sin, if you want to say, against humanity ever, more than eclipsed all the stuff that's come before this, is this thing. I don't know how many of you do dark field blood microscopy, but we do it in our office. I've been doing it for 25 years. So this is a blood smear. The round little bubble circles are red blood cells. They're congested. But these foreign bodies that are in there, these are hydrogels. These are foreign substances that are part of the makeup of the vaccine. We're finding now that these are in many other medications and many other things but they congeal in the bloodstream, and they're part of the reason for the high inflammation, for the thrombosis, and the high inflammation. So I've never seen this before two years ago, and here's some different pictures of them. These are sometimes magnetically active. You probably early on saw the videos on YouTube where someone took a magnet, put it against their chest or against their vaccine site, leaned over and the magnet stuck. Some of these things have actually magnetic properties. Here's some more. They're grueling. They're foreign. We, we find these in about 80% of patients. Do they ever go away? They can go away with the proper treatment. Yeah. Ibu's very helpful for this. Here's another one. Now, if you want to live a long time, you have to not die of the things that kill most people when you're too young. So this is 2019, cause of death, United States, heart disease. 659,000, cancer, 599,000. Here's the real number one cause of death. So it's iatrogenic death. Iatrogenic definition, due to the activity of a physician or doctor prescribed therapy. Chiropractors, naturopaths, nutritionists, physical therapists, body workers, they don't do this to people. Medical doctors and DOs do this to people. Because we have a license to practice medicine, and with that license comes things that can hurt people very badly. 
The biggest risk you have in life is to get under the care of a medical doctor because this, ki this kills more people than anything. I'm not saying that all medicine is bad. If you're having a heart attack or you need a C-section or you have a broken leg, well, a doctor can really help you out. But if you have some chronic illness, hypertension, hypercholesterol, obesity, Alzheimer's, rheumatoid arthritis, you don't want to see a medical doctor. During the pandemic years, the estimate is that a million people in the United States died with COVID and three million people died worldwide from a bioengineered virus. My background is infectious disease. I did a fellowship in infectious disease. I was a um, attending staff member at UC San Diego uh, for about five years and my field was virology. So coronaviruses appear every year. They mutate, and since the early 70s, people tried to make vaccines against them, but they couldn't effectively do it because the viruses mutate every year and the vaccine would never be effective. The only way you can get a, a, a coronavirus to actually get stable is if you add genes from uh, an ACE2 receptor, an HIV gene, and a mad cow gene, and now you got coronavirus. It's bioengineered, and no one ever saw this before, and that's what's happening. So you implant this into people, it causes them problems, then you have a vaccine ready to go, and it causes them more problems. The estimate of that doctors were able to prescribe ivermectin, uh, hydroxychloroquine, that the death rate probably would have been 90% less than it was. In Clearwater, Florida, we still can't prescribe ivermectin and get it filled by CVS or a regular pharmacy. Okay, so now, Here's what I want, really want to talk to you about, is we're healthcare practitioners. We have to save ourselves if we're going to help other people. And then we need some technology to be able to do it on ourselves, figure out what works, and then give it to other people so that they can do this. And so that's what my practice is about. Uh, what will help me, what will help other people. And so I've sort of taken it on as an experiment. My partner in the experiment is my wife. And so we, we, we investigate things on ourselves. <laughs> now, I have some goals. You know, I want to live as long as Moses. Uh, I want to work until the end. I want to die fast in my sleep at age 120. My hobby is Ironman triathlons. I've done 43 of them. Very few people in, in the world have ever done that many. Uh, I'm still racing. And I want to win my age group at the Ironman World Championship at age 85. So that, that hasn't been done before. <laughs> That's really why I'm doing this. Okay. I want to write some more books, spend time with my wife and family. I used to play classical guitar. I want to take that up again, write a rock opera. And then we're putting together now an integrative medicine college that I think will be able to train doctors to do what we're doing. We have a very successful clinic. We have 85 staff. Um, three MDs, five nurse practitioners, and we see, um, you know, we see people from all over and we deal with complex illness. So we worked out sort of formulas and strategies to be able to do that, and um, my next goal is to be able to teach other people how. Now, one of the first things I do when I meet with a new patient is I want them to understand some basic biology, because what I'm talking to them about is that their biology has gone bad. And if we can get their biology, if I can get them to understand their biology, we can get them to do the things to make their biology go back to good. So, the basic unit of the human body is a single cell. Now, if you look at a single cell and you put it in a Petri dish, and you measure the number of enzymatic reactions that occur in that cell so that it can take in what it needs, get rid of what it doesn't need, produce the proteins and bioregulators that it needs, the enzymatic reaction rate is about 100,000 times per second. Okay? Now, if you count up all the cells in the human body, they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 trillion. Give or take a decimal point or two, it doesn't matter. It's, a, it's more than all the known structures in the universe. 
hundred trillion. Now, you've got a single cell at a hundred thousand times per second reaction rate, and you've got a hundred trillion of them. How are you going to manage this entity? Now, it gets worse than that, because if you count up all the bacteria in your gut, it's about 400 trillion. They're in us. They're an organ. If you count up all the environmental within a cubic foot of air around your body, there are tens of millions of viruses and bacteria and other organisms. We are life. We live in a sea of life. Now, if you look at the body as a biocomputer, our nervous system's job is to be able to sense all the stuff from the outside and the inside, and then control the cells and all the stuff inside of us to be able to keep us alive. So that we're upright, we're breathing, it's gotta work when we're running, when we're sitting on the toilet, when we're sleeping, when we're 30,000 foot in an airplane, when we're scuba diving. Now this is no small feat to be able to get the communication and keep all this stuff going. Now if you took a new computer out of the box and you plugged it into the internet, it would be very fast and it would work very well. But as we all know, within a couple of years, that computer starts to go slow. It accumulates viruses and malware and spyware and somebody spills coffee on it and there's dust and it doesn't work because the communication system doesn't work. And that's what happens to us. Out of the box, if we had a healthy mother, we probably were okay. Now, living in this universe with hundreds of thousands of biotoxins that we drink and eat and put on our skin and smell, we get full of this stuff. And this stuff messes with our regulation system. So the system can no longer coordinate all the stuff that, happens to, that has to happen uh, with our bodies, and that's disease. Okay, that's disease. And most of the time, the biggest intake of stuff is, is that we eat and drink, and these things get on our intestine, and then our intestines go bad, and then we malabsorb and we maldigest, and then we end up with two big problems. One is we're toxic, and the second one is we are deficient in things. And then if you add along that some structural stuff, that's everything that's wrong with anybody. Now, almost all this communication comes in electromagnetically. So our nervous systems perceive electromagnetic frequencies. That's sight, that's sound. And so if that stuff comes in and it's not coordinated right, then it doesn't work. And so if you start thinking of evolution and biology, you got an entity that, that receives all of this information. It's about three pounds, it's a brain, and it's able to get all this stuff. If you took this problem to a computer engineer and you said, I got a cell that does 100,000 times per second, and I got 100 trillion of them, design me a computer or an AI system that would coordinate all this stuff. And by the way, it's got to fit inside someone's skull. So the whole thing's an impossibility. Life is actually a complete impossibility. So there's no way, you know, the, the, the solar system is supposed to be about 13 or 14 billion years old. The Earth is about 5 billion years old. Humans have been on the Earth for about 2.5 million years. You can set up any trial and error system that you want to get all this, this complexity of physiology by a trial and error method and you will never get there. We are created beings and there's just no other way around it. Okay, so I want to talk about biohacking because if we're going to improve ourselves and improve our patients, we got to hack them. So I like this definition of biohacking, strategic biological experimentation, especially on oneself. And I encourage you to experiment on yourself because every one of us is a little bit different. With the goal of enhancing or augmenting performance, health, mood, etc. 
So this is my favorite kind of food, and we're gonna, I'm gonna take you through kind of a smorgasbord of things that I've learned and that I'm using in my practice to help people move through this environment that we're in now so that they can keep their physiology intact. So I've been taking uh, Methylene Blue for about two years. It's one of the most amazing products ever. It's been around since 1891. It was used as a malarial treatment, and it's got some very interesting characteristics. It's able to get electrons and donate electrons. If you saw Dr. Levy's lecture yesterday, like vitamin C, it can receive and donate electrons. And that makes it a very positive physiological substance. So if you want to recycle your NAD, methylene blue can do it. If you want to keep your iron in a reduced state, methylene blue can do it. You know, next door, Dr. Th uh, Thompson is talking about iron physiology. Part of the problem with a lot of free radicals <clears throat> excuse me, in the environment is that it oxidizes iron to plus three so that iron in your red cells won't pick up oxygen and iron in your cytochromes won't be active to produce energy or to detox. So if you can keep it reduced, which methylene blue does, you get better. Now, methylene blue improves mitochondrial respiration, it improves brain energy metabolism, cognitive performance, prevents cognitive decline, it's neuroprotective. It, up, it upregulates NRF2, so your antioxidant enzyme systems are on. It's got a pretty long half-life. I told you about the cytochromes. Now, it's a very small molecule. It will cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, there are safe products. I would be careful about what methylene blue products you buy because some of them are chemicals, and they're contaminated, and they're not good. And so uh, Gene has some products next door, and there's some other ones. I can, if anybody's interested, I can let you know which, which products we use. But we find it very effective. I, play, I put it on every patient. Now, if you think you're going to take real active good methylene blue at a 50 milligram dose, there's something not right with that. We start our, our patients, and it's a liposomal methylene blue, on a drop a day because some people can only take three drops. They will herx on three drops. So methylene blue kills viruses, it kills bacteria, it kills cancer cells. Now I'm taking 42 drops a day, that's about 60 milligrams, but it takes a while to work up to that. And we find that for every person there's an optimum physiological dose where you feel the brain energy, you will feel your own energy. So it's very important that you do that. Okay, you want USP 99% pure, uh, methylene blue, watch out for the contaminants. Anything where you want improved oxygen delivery. Now this could be post-stroke, it could be traumatic brain injury, it could be MI. You want methylene blue because it will help exchange and keep uh, oxygen delivery. There is a neuroprotective effect of methylene blue on the brain. And this is really important. It promotes autophagy in injured, injured cells, and it inhibits microglial activation so you don't get an overactive immune reaction. I'm just going to do a second on this because I've got too much to talk to you about. Um, this word, nanobioelectronic photoacoustic therapeutics, Took me about three hours to figure out what that meant. <laughs> what it meant is that if you stimulate cells in just the right way, with the exact right wavelength, you can take a dormant stem cell, embryonic stem cell in your body, that hasn't aged at all since you were born, and get it active. The problem with most stem cell technology, if you're doing fat or you're doing bone marrow, is that those cells are as old as you are. And are you going to get much benefit? I don't doubt that you can get some. The other problem is those cells are big. Those mesenchymal cells are big. 
the lung capillaries are about four microns. Those cells are 30 microns. These very small embryonic-like cells could be extracted from the blood. A special laser that's photoacoustic, photo means it's light plus sound, can activate these very small stem cells, and they're only a micron or two. They will go through, if you give it intravenously, to all parts of the body. Um, and this is available for people to learn how to do, and um, if you want more information, let me know. Now, I think these guys used to exhibit, so I, I'm, I love these cells, and we see amazing things happen in our clinic in people who get cells. You know, sometimes wheelchair cases will start walking in three months after the cells, so they're, they're quite extraordinary. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you were here some years ago, these guys exhibited here. I have no financial relationship with these people, but I love their technology. What you see here is a big tent, and down in the bottom there is a black little oxygen concentrator. So if you turn on the oxygen concentrator, it will concentrate, it will make O2. And if you take the O2 and put it in the bag, you can get O2 between 85 and 90% and fill up the bag with the oxygen. So I go out to my, um, my study, and a half an hour before I want to do a treatment on myself, I turn on the machine, it fills up the tent with oxygen. I then get on a stationary bike, I put a mask on, and I turn the oxygen on so that I am breathing this 90% oxygen, and I exercise warm up. After three minutes, there's a valve where I can turn the oxygen off, and it gives me oxygen that's equivalent to the level of Mount Everest to breathe. And during when I turn that on, I do high intensity on that bicycle. And it doesn't take very long for my pulse ox to go from 99 to 58. Now that's low. And then you feel like you're going to die because you don't have any oxygen. And then you turn the oxygen back on and breathe for a minute until you've recovered. And I usually do this seven or eight times. Now, so it's a hypoxic stress followed by oxygen. I want to show you what happens. The studies that were done, these are oxygen sensors that you can put on the head, and they actually measure the actual oxygen level in the brain. And so when you go through this hypoxic stress, and, and not, you, when you start, you don't go to 58. When you start, you might go to 90 and feel shortness of breath, and then you turn it back on. So you get better at this. And your system starts to adapt at this. And when this has been measured, just get through this. Here's a graph of what happens. And so if you look at here, this is... No, starting here, turn off the oxygen, exercise. This is the oxygen level, dives. You get out of breath, you then turn the oxygen back on, off, on, off, on. Sequentially, the brain with the oxygen gets more and more circulation. You get more and more oxygen. When you get to this point, the body completely switches its physiology, so it like four to six times increases the circulation in the brain. It turns on 2,3-DPG, it turns on these enzymes, and this recovery from here to here is still in the hypoxic state. That's no oxygen. You call this beast mode. If you're an athlete, this is beast mode. Your spleen can dump a unit of blood into your system to try to get more oxygen. Now, the physiologic effect of this is very, uh, very significant. I'm just going to run through these. That's the beast mode at the end. So, if you do neurological testing on people, 
what you can show. So if you look on the right hand side, you have, so these are all neurological testing parameters. You got a low, low average, average. So after one of these treatments, the very lows go away, the lows go away, the low averages go away, and now you got above. This turns on brain cells. It actually heals brain cells. Here's another case. This is the top, is pre-treatment. All these red ones are very low. This is two weeks later with the treatment. Look at the improvement in brain function. Same on this one. Now my oldest grandson is uh, 17 years old. He's a senior in high school. He's one of the best runners in, in the state of New York. He's a cross country runner. And uh, he started doing this about six weeks ago. And in six weeks, he had a 30 second improvement in his, the, the races are, the cross country races are about 5K. Had a 30 second improvement in his best 5K run. That's extraordinary. And his coach couldn't believe what was happening to him. Now, the Dallas Cowboys use this. There are a lot of professional athletes that use this. But this is something that you can do for yourself, and it can be used in the clinic. And for neuro rehab, it's fantastic because this heals up organs and tissues and brain cells and expedites recovery. Okay, next topic. How many of you heard of this guy? How many people do it? Okay, everybody should put their hand up. This is the no cost, best way if you want to rehabilitate your autonomic nervous system. 15 minutes a day, that's what it takes. So these are breathing exercises. I do them every morning when I first get up. It takes me exactly 15 minutes, okay? You produce hyperoxia in your body and hypoxia in your body. And this helps neuro regeneration. Now, he's in ice because if you combine it with cold, you even get a better effect. How many of you are doing cold plunges? Okay, that's that grandson of mine. Now he has no body fat and he doesn't like cold water. He eventually did get in, but this is a remarkable thing. Have all the patients do this. They don't have to buy a cold plunge. In Florida, in, the, in nine months of the year, the cold water on the, on the shower isn't very cold. But in those of you that live in cold climates, if you turn on the water, you start with 10 seconds, work up to three to five minutes, Cold water, you want to be cold, okay? And if you can't do that, I just tell the patient, you get a great big bowl, put ice in it, put water in it, put your face in it. Take a deep breath, put your face in it, hold your breath for 30 seconds, take it out. Do that three or four times. You can get pretty much the same stimulus. If you read Wim Hof's book, he has actually been studied. And there are lots of studies on what, what how he transformed his own physiology. One of the most daring one was that he, he checked into a hospital and he was in an ICU and they wired him up and they injected E. coli bacteria in his blood. And he didn't shock out and he didn't get septic and nothing happened to him. He took 26 people who all had some chronic illness, put them through a six week training on the cold exposure plus the breathing. They all went to Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro, and they walked from whatever the low level is, zero feet, to 15,000 feet. And the guys had shorts on and tennis shoes, no shirt, no long pants, 15,000 feet, and every one of them made it. So it's pretty extraordinary how you can transform your physiology with practically nothing, okay? Now, when you cold expose, there's these things called cold shock proteins. I'd never heard of these things before. And they play a role in muscle growth. They quadruple protein synthesis and they quench free radicals, okay? So it helps you with muscle mass, it helps with inflammation, faster wound healing, thermogenesis, brown fat. The, this other point is very interesting. You know, if someone does cocaine, what they're getting is a dopamine surge. Their baseline dopamine goes up about two and a half times, but the half-life of cocaine is very short. It's only about nine minutes. If you get in that cold plunge for five minutes, 
you will get a two and a half times increase in your dopamine level, same as cocaine, but it will last three or four hours. Once you get below 55, it's cold. You can go down to 39 if you want. I don't see any point to it. We keep our tub at 52 to 54. It does get easier uh, unless you take a break. We took a three-week vacation, and I didn't do the break, and I came back, and I had to start all over again. Like, really tough, okay? Now, for the exercise challenge, if you want to live old, you got to keep your muscles because sarcopenia tracks with aging perfectly. Now, no matter what you do, you can't totally overcome this, but you can do as good as you can. When I was in college, I was one of the best guys in my class where I could sit on the floor in the gymnastics gym, the rope was 25 feet high, and I could have my legs out and with my arms climb up to the top, touch it, and come back down. And I had one of the best times. Now to do 10 pull-ups is a full-out struggle. And I've been working on my muscles. So wherever you are right now, you got to keep your muscles. Because if you fall down, you're going to break something. And then once you break a hip, you got about a 30 or 50% chance of being dead in the next year. Because it's very bad for the body. This is a system that I love. It's easy. This guy wrote the book. He's a PhD. Um, physical therapist. He's got clinics all over the United States to help, to help people with osteoporosis. This is a 10-minute workout routine to gain all your muscles back, get stronger and bigger, and it's got some stretch cords, and it's simple, and it's easy, and it really works. And I cited you the references for this whole thing, which you can look at later if you want to. I just read the book, and I think you'll be impressed. Okay, next thing. Now, I have talked about this before to some groups, but I find that virtually nobody I know, and you guys, you know, all my friends here, virtually nobody I know is using this as a diagnostic point. There is this thing called cranial cervical syndrome. I wrote an article in Townsend Letter on it. This is C1, C2 mal rotated. Now your vagus nerve hub nucleus is right behind C1. You get C1 rotated or offset, it affects the vagus nerve. It also blocks cerebral spinal fluid flow. And when you block flow, you can't detox the brain. And when you affect the vagus nerve improperly, you get malregulation, headaches, dizziness, blurred vision, POTS, irregular heartbeats. It's very, very common. And um, I probably send 30 or 40 percent of the people I see two places. One is to the upper cervical chiropractor who does this, and the rest of them go to the dentist. Most of the people go to both, because chronically ill people have this going on. So any of these symptoms, I hear any of these symptoms, 90 percent of the patients with POTS They've been through the ENT and, and, and uh, POTS plus vertigo. They've been to the ENT, nothing. They've been trialed on drugs, nothing. They've been to the cardiologist and had full electrophysiology workups, no answer. They go to the upper cervical doctor and the stuff resolves. It's a miracle. And the ones that don't have cavitations in their wisdom tooth sites and sometimes that helps. Now, just an example case, this guy's name is Marion. I met him because his best friends, he lives in, in Slovakia, his best friends live in Clearwater, and the best friend's wife, mother, got breast cancer, and she came to us, and we healed her breast cancer. And so this guy was distraught with his symptoms, and so he came to Clearwater from Slovakia. He's a lawyer, been unable to work for five years. I was the 17th doctor that he'd seen. He said, you're my last shot. If you can't help me, I am literally going to kill myself. No pressure. <laughs> His sensation was, I've got this feeling that between my brain and my skull, there is something that is pushing down on my brain. 
And when that thing pushes down on my brain, I feel dizziness and vertigo, and I have the sensation that I'm outside my body and I can't get back in, and that makes me feel crazy. Severe depression, suicidal. So I examined him. He had all the other stuff that everybody's got, Lyme and parasites and herpes 6 and the rest of the stuff. And I sent him to my upper cervical chiropractor, and I said, uh, take a look at him, OK? Now, when she took one look at him, she said, we got to go to Rochester, New York. And she got on a plane with him, and they flew to Rochester, New York. And they saw there a radiologist. He's a chiropractic radiologist who can do cerebral spinal fluid imaging studies on people. Now, if you look at the left-hand frame, you can see that there's obstruction here. See it? Yeah. Hangs up. One adjustment later, one upper cervical adjustment later, look at the flow here. Watch it. Both sides, wide open. So she had the diagnosis. The transverse look at the upper of C1, whoops, C and C1, it's rotated out of place 20 degrees. He didn't have neck pain or neck symptoms. This is the jugular vein, open. Look, it's pushed closed. When you obstruct jugular vein flow, you obstruct CSF flow out of the brain, which is how the brain detoxifies itself, that glymphatic system, okay? So the next one, there was a little bit of improvement after the first adjustment. Took her about three months to get him stabilized. And he went home. He went back to work. And he was fine. Nothing dramatic. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they've had a car accident, they've fallen off a horse, you know, they played hockey or something. But sometimes they don't. Uh, a lot of low back pain is this. Now, most chiropractors don't know about this. This is a two-year, the, the person that's in Clearwater, she runs the training program for graduate chiropractors. It's a two-year program. And so I went there. So I, I had all these patients that had success. And it's like, well, check me out. So I went over there. And she does a range of motion. It was limited. She does the, do the x-rays, says, you're off. I got the adjustment. Now, these adjustments are, they barely touch you. I mean, it's like, it's very pinpointed to move that bone back. After my first adjustment, she sits me back on the table. No, not quite there. Does it again. Sit up. Okay, you're there. She said, I'll see you in three days. I, get, I said, that's it, that's it. I get off at the table. As I'm walking out of the room, I feel like an endorphin rush in my low back and a relaxation. And I turned around and looked at her and I said, Julie, what just happened? I realized that I'd had such long-term chronic low back pain that I was numb to it. And when this went back on right, that went right, and it was cured. So a couple more times, it was fine. Now, fast forward five years. A new guy comes to town. He's got another way to do this. Well, he's got a machine that does it, OK? So I meet him, and he said, you ought to come in and let me check you. I said, fine. I go in and he checks me. Now. I have no symptoms, and I'm active. You know, I'm swimming 10,000 yards a week, and I'm at yoga and all this stuff. I'll show you later. And I'm way off. Okay, creep. Atlas lateral displacement, 1.5 degrees. C2, axis, 12.96 degrees off. Lower neck displacement, 4.5 degrees. C1 rotation, 10 degrees. 
I go into him. I get the adjustment. Now, before he does the adjustment, he does a test on me. And you guys should all try this stuff. Is you close your eyes, walk in place, 50 steps. So when he did me up front, he, I count 50, he said, okay, open your eyes. And I was over here. I didn't know it, but my eyes are closed, and I think I'm just walking in place where I am. And I'm over against the wall. So he does the adjustment. The adjustment corrects it 87% over what was before. He says, okay, let's see how you walk in place. And I walked 50 steps in place with my eyes closed, and I didn't move at all. I was in the same place. Now, this is neural integration structurally, which is very, it's fantastic. And I can guarantee you half the patients that you're seeing have this and don't know it. And the regular chiropractic whiplash adjustments are not good for this. It doesn't work. This is a very specific targeted thing. Okay, so staying well is a full-time job. Basically, you have to keep healthy cells. What causes bad cells? Well, free radicals. Unhealthy cells have no energy. So you gotta slow down this oxidative stress. So this is a long story, but I'm gonna tell you the very short version of it. There's a king in a far off land a long time ago, and he was looking for an answer. He was getting towards the end of his life, and he felt he needed to know what was a secret that if it was known would unlock the secret of life and would create abundance in all things and a long, healthy life. And so he put it out to his population. He says, I need 10 volunteers to go find this out. If you actually find this out, and come back to me with the answer to this secret of life, then I'll give you half my kingdom. But if you come back and you've got some bogus answer for me, I'm gonna chop off your head. So he sends them all out, they had a two week deadline, nine people return after two weeks, and they don't have the answer and they lose their heads. And they're waiting for the other guy, they said he's coming, but it's taken him a while. He finally gets there and the king says, you have the answer for me? And he says, yes I do, sir. And he said, I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want everybody to know unless you don't want to tell them. He says, okay. He whispers in her ear. He says, okay, what is the secret? And the secret is, there's no such thing in life as a free lunch, okay? If you want health, you gotta actively do it. Health is not a right, it's not an obligation, it isn't natural, especially in this environment. It takes work. And that's the no free lunch. If you want to eat whatever you want, if you want to drink whatever you want, if you want to lay on the couch for as long as you want, you will not be healthy. You will die of some awful disease and you'll go to some doctor who will assist you in the process. So here's the sort of have to do's that are on my list. You gotta eat organic, you gotta exercise a lot. You gotta get sunshine daily, you gotta poop daily, you gotta sleep enough, you gotta supplement enough, you gotta have some friends. You gotta challenge yourself to do hard things. I don't know if you guys know who Gary Brecke is, but he's a, he's a, a friend and a collaborator. And he made up this definition. He said, aging is the relentless pursuit of comfort. If you are chasing comfort, you will age faster. You gotta get cold, you gotta get hot, you gotta get, uh, you gotta get hungry. These things keep your physiology sharp and keep you going. And I just don't think there's any way around it. Because when stress does come in the form of a physical problem or a mental spiritual problem, if you have trained yourself so that your autonomic nervous system through the breath work and the saunas and the cold and the exercise, you will be much hardier and you will take it better. And then you gotta have a purpose in life to help others so that you have a reason to actually just be around here. Now I have a whole routine and this is probably way over the top for, for most people, but you know I like to swim, bike and run. So 12 to 14 hours a week I swim, bike and run and I do the breath work, and I do the X3, and I do yoga and calisthenics, and I do that live O2, 
and I do sauna and cold plunge and vibroplate and I get my upper cervical adjusted and I get my V-cells every three or four months. And I do a high protein, low carb diet. I work on muscles. I work on my VO2 max. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, my wife is here. She's my partner in all things good and bad. And um, a lot of the stuff we do together. I have terrible genes. I've done four different companies' gene tests, and my genes are terrible. And my two brothers and sister, they're all of diabetes, they're all overweight, they all have cardiovascular disease, they're all a mess, okay? And I've outlived both my parents, they had the same problems. And I think if you work at this stuff, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, die of that stuff, at least too soon, okay? So I take supplements to overcome the bad genes and environment, sleep enough, work a lot. Now, I won't go through this. Here's my supplement list. There's a couple of them that I, I think are really important. If you don't know about Prodrome Labs, you ought to look it up. The name of the book is Breaking Alzheimer's. The lipid biochemist's name is Dane Goodnow. It's a fascinating read. Uh, I had to read it twice because I, I didn't understand lipid chemistry very well. But if you want to give people programs so they can prevent MS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's disease, you run this lab on them, you will get stuff to really improve it. I have a family history of, of, of hyper homocysteinemia. I think that's why my dad died of a heart attack, why my brother had heart attacks, why my grandfather died of a heart attack. And my homocysteine is 16, and I know all about homocysteine, and those of you who work with it, I have a, a single gene uh, MTHFR, and I took every variation on every company's products, and my homocysteine did not budge. So when I went and did this prodrome test, and I got a consult from the doctor who, who, who runs the test, he says, oh, your homocysteine's high. And I said to him, don't even talk to me about it. You got nothing that'll help me, because I know a lot about homocysteine. He says, okay, let's do this. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so check your homocysteine in two months. Eight. Okay, so this is fascinating biochemistry, and it's really good. Huh? What I added was creatine and uh, NAC and, um, I don't know, it's on the list, something else. It wasn't more B5, B6, methylfolate, methyl B12. It wasn't any of those. Okay, so, what? Prodrome Labs. And I get the book. And he's got, he's got courses, I think they're free, for doctors to learn this biochemistry. And they're online, and you could just sign up, and then you get certified, and they're super interesting. He's super interesting. This not only applies to neurological disease, the profiles go for various kinds of cancers, autism, incredible. Some of the, so I'm, there's a, there, once, you're, once you're through the course, you can do a monthly meeting with him where cases get presented. And some of the autism cases that people are getting with addition of like a couple supplements, these kids are waking up. It, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Okay, so sarcopenia kills, it's in your future. I think if you get a gram of protein per pound of body weight, you're gonna, you're gonna be the best. That's hard to do, that's a lot of protein. So we have this product called Perfect Amino. If you take two scoops, it equals 30 grams of animal protein, okay? So if I take two scoops, that's, 60, that's uh, uh, two scoops, it'd be 30 grams. I do that twice a day. I got 60 grams of protein, and I need, a, I need 160 for my weight. So if I have five eggs, that's 60 grams of protein. If I eat eight ounces of meat or fish, that's another about 60 grams of protein. I can get there. Trying to do it with food alone is very tough. The other thing is the environment's terrible. It's terrible, no matter what you do. And this little product called Metal Free is, is pretty extraordinary. Increase the glyphosate excretion. This is three days on Metal Free, just measuring pre and post urine levels of glyphosate, DEP, MTBE. The amounts that, the increase in excretion whew, is huge. Okay, I need to, I, whew, five minutes. Okay, so I do the true diagnostic Gene testing, okay, before every V cell. Now, I'm 75, so my last, this is my last one. So, um, 
immune age y wise, intrinsic immune system, I'm 64, 5. Immune age extrinsic, so this is your adaptive immune system, I'm 47. <clears throat> That's what you want. Uh, telomere 64. So that's the goal. You, you reduce your age. Now, VO2 max is one of the most important measures. It's more strongly associated with reduced mortality risk than any other metric we know of. Okay? What's VO2 max? It's how much oxygen can you utilize, the volume of oxygen that you can utilize per minute. Okay? So you get on a treadmill or you get on a stationary bike and you exercise so you can't push it anymore and they measure your gases and they give you what a VO2 max is. Okay? Now, my VO2 max is 42. The charts don't go up to 75 years old. Okay, so here's the chart. Look across the top. <clears throat> Excellent, goes up to 65. If you're greater than 40, you're doing good. So I got 10 years on him, and I'm above that. That's what you want. Now, walking is good, but it won't improve your VO2 max. You gotta exert it, you gotta move it, you gotta work it. <coughs> okay, after all said and done, the truth is we're spirits, we inhabit bodies, they age, we die, but we don't really die. That's just the cycle of life. We're all in that. If you serve successfully, it means you helped a lot of people. Um, medicine has tools for healing, but the real tool, the real, real important tool, assuming you know what to do as a healthcare practitioner, is that you've got to really connect with that patient and you gotta, that's how you're going to help that patient. So health is connectedness. People are disconnected from themselves, from their families, from their groups, from the universe, from God, name your area. They are disconnected and that is sickness. And part of I see my job is to help them reconnect. And if I can connect with them on a heart level, I can really help them. Now there's a fascinating experience with physics experiment, quantum physics experiment. They took a beam of light, they split it, and they directed it so one went that way, seven miles, one went that way, seven miles. So they're 14 miles apart. On the one that was over here, they took a magnetic field and they pressed it against the beam and the beam bent. And the purpose of the experiment was to see would the other beam bend too that's 14 miles away? And the other beam bent too when they shined the light on this one. So then they wanted to know what was the lag in time between this one bending and that one bending. And they had atomic clocks there that measured out to the millionths of a second. And what they found is there was no time. When this one bent, that one bent, exactly the same time, immeasurable. Okay? Now that's quantum, that's quantum level, okay? Now, if you go to any religious tradition, so, traditional Old Testament, let there be light, creation. If you look in the New Testament, in the beginning was the word, creation. These are energetic creations. These are energetic impulses, thrusts. We're on that beam. And each of us has our own set of beams. And by golly, anything that you do does affect everybody else, and what they do affects everybody else. And if we can get this connection going, using our medical tools and also our heart tools as practitioners, we can do a whole lot of good. Now, I want to do an experiment with you. I'm going to read you a poem, okay? Now, this poem is reserved for my wife, but I have permission to, to read it to you now, okay? Because it's very intimate. My idea is that this is heart expressed the best I've ever seen it. The poet's name is E. e. Cummings. He was an American poet, early 1900s. And so I want you to close your eyes and I want you to listen to the poem. And then we're gonna finish. Here we go. Oops, wait, open them back up. One more thing. 
Just one more tradition. So this is, this is the Eastern tradition, yoga tradition. Heart chakra. Okay. Loving, empathetic, open-hearted, serenity, emotional balance, trustworthiness, tolerance. When it's not balanced, it's our world. Loneliness, demanding, critical, jealous, cold-hearted, narcissistic, blah, blah, blah. So the heart's got to get fixed. Okay, close your eyes again. Just a minute. Oh, goodness. All right, here we go. Sometimes I have trouble getting through this, so if I stutter a little bit, just take it into consideration. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, my dear, and whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I fear no fate, for you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world, for beautiful, you are my world, my true. And it's you are whatever a moon has always meant and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. Thank you very much. <laughs>